Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. This is one of those photographs that stands apart. It's, I think it's a, yes, yeah, a fourth photo. I think the, se- the sequence is almost uh, random, you know, but it happens to be a photograph not of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, the lighting is bonkers. So it's Isn't almost, it gorgeous? Yeah, so it almost, it almost looks like one of those um, HDR types Im- images where, where the light is just perfect across the board, across the whole frame. Uh, there's a guy on a bicycle where they have a, with a plastic basket in the front. The bicycle looks like it's from 1950s. Isn't it great? Yeah. yeah. He's wearing a mask. You can see his nose. I was going to say, he's wearing a mask incorrectly, Ish. but well, he's... Yeah, it's okay. He's wearing it like a jock. He's strap. making an effort. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so he's going through a uh, an area of, I'm assuming, Shangwan or whatever. There's markets. So there's, there's it like, looks, I think, like uh, oranges, an orange stall on the left. Yeah, it's uh, Sham Shui Po. Sham Shui Po. Okay. So what is what around this image? Um, last year, off the back of doing that first portrait that we spoke about, I had an idea to do start a, a personal a personal project called Twenty Women of Twenty Twenty. Mm. So, after working with Janine and having that sort of existential crisis, and I was just like I was working my tail off with private clients and sort of building that business, and I just went, I just want to do something that is not commissioned, is not dictated by you know a client's desires, but just for me. So we spoke about, I've always been really passionate about storytelling through NGOs and 20 Women of 2020 was meant to be a message of hope told through the eyes of women in Hong Kong who are experts in their field, entrepreneurs, artists, people doing something that, you know, is, is amazing, but also very much woman, woman centric and woman focused. And this was taken on a day that I had met with um, one of my 20 women. Her name is Lindsay Barty. And Lindsay Barty is an amazing journalist and professional rugby player because, you know, it's Hong Kong. Everybody's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm an actor slash I run like a bungee company. Or, you right, know, like right, 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 everybody's right. got these really awesome dovetails sure. um, careers. And I just met Lindsay. Um, I think it was the first time, first or second time I'd met her. And she like agreed to be on the podcast. I uh, sorry, on the podcast. Uh, agreed to be part of the series. And I just I was on my own and walking around, you know, this market. And I've always been really inspired. Inspired is kind. I'm really jealous <laughs> <laughs> That's of the work. No. Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, of the work of Fan Ho, okay. who did those beautiful black and whites of Hong Kong and. You know, Hong Kong light, Hong Kong light like this mm-hmm. is just, it's its poetry. Right. It's so beautiful. Mm. And I was just, you know, I'd taken a day off to go do something for me. And, you know, you're not making meals for anybody. You're not um, answering questions from a little version of yourself. So many questions. And I just had this moment in this market and I was watching watching the light coming through and, yeah, I just got to have that, you know that perfect frame and I just love it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm really proud of that image yeah it's a podcast which is audio about, <laughs> about photographs I was gonna say it's a it's an interesting <laughs> medium <laughs> I, I may be an idiot I may be a complete idiot but but people can go to the different places to see the images with photography being a commodity that's everywhere and photographs being you know everywhere we're inundated. But, yeah. So the question is, what kind of story are you telling? Kind of what is what is actually being communicated? So this is just a kind of a reflection. So at that moment, when you made this photograph of this guy on the bicycle, and it could easily be this image. You want to romanticize it of say the 1920s or 50s or whatever. But it's obviously today. It's obviously you know it's this really high contrast, beautiful. Kodachrome style color. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense to you. Yeah, absolutely. But even the thing, like on the absolute edge of the photo is on the ground in Hong Kong because the, the way the traffic works, they paint on the roads, you know, look right or look left. And you could just see, you could just see on the edge, it says, okay, right. So it's supposed to be look right, but you see it's like 
kind of okay, like, okay, right? Maybe that's even a subconscious thing that you didn't see. I love that you say that. I lo- I'm i so specific with my copy. I had, <laughs> I had some very good teachers. And uh, you, know, you know how you like, when you're learning, you critique your work. And I'm like, what about that rock in the corner? They're like, uh-huh. God damn it, you ruined that photo for me. I'm like, yeah. it's very distracting. I don't yeah. like it. Yeah, I um, I, I pride myself on my cropping. It's yeah. um, I like to so, say to people like, oh, I love that detail. I'm like, it's not a mistake. No, of course. <laughs> no, of course not. No, no, but exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Let's kind of pull the focus back even more. Okay. So where are you now in terms of your look ahead into the future, your look as a photographer, as a... So you're doing a lot of work with, specifically with, feels like focusing and highlighting the, the female experience. I think, um, you know, present company included, photography is a very male-dominated industry. Mm. And you seem absolutely delightful, but a <laughs> lot of a lot of women, they all have their, like, creepy male photographer story, you know? That's the most beautiful insult I've ever heard. Ever I, seen. I know. I've, I have been. I've been thinking about this all week, and going like, I have to say it, but it's oh, it's yeah. close. The male yeah. gaze in photography is definitely, definitely a a factor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The person who I'm publishing just before you, yes, is uh, I'm going to butcher her name, Andrea Bjorsel. Uh, she's from Sweden. And her photography is, like, she's a photographer, and is, and she has that, that exquisite compositions that you have totally different aesthetic, totally different look. Yeah. Totally, you know, and that's what I love about very, photography, absolute, right? Absolutely. So it's really interesting and fascinating that that came up. I don't know if it came up in the podcast, but in a separate conversation about, you know, I understand, like, my work was in Human Rights Commission, and, like, I'm... I'm I've done a bit of photography professionally, and I know that that, especially in fashion. Oh yeah! Holy shit! It's just like what a, what a cesspool in yeah. many ways. Yeah, it's absolutely. So, awful. why don't you speak to that in okay. terms of present company exclude? Imagine I'm on the room. Oh my just god! Unload, unload. No, no it's, it's fine. It's fine. I think what what I see a lot, um, and you know, when I was when I was. Uh, a kid you just didn't want to have your photo taken um and you know like you sort of like early um late teens early 20s and you know you meet a guy he's like oh well, I'm a photographer why don't you come over to the studio and I'm like and this is this is before me too this is like sure. the the um early 2000s which was such a Filthy, hypersexualized, uh, especially for young women, decade. Uh, I think it was coming off the back of grunge, and it sort of went to all this, like you know, the Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears aesthetic, and it was these young, like young girls. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's it's nothing like now with the sort of the Instagram um, juggernaut of women sort of owning their own bodies and owning their own images. But it was men taking photographs of these girls, mm-hmm. of these women. Mm-hmm. And the women that I work with now still say like, yeah, I had I had some really nice headshots done a few years ago, but the dude was just she just creeped me out. And I'm all for body positivity and loving the skin you're in. Like everybody's got stuff that they're just like, fuck, I do not want to see this on Sally Lloyd. Sure. I don't want to have this like on my LinkedIn. So I guess my point of differentiation is understanding you know, the, the pain points, if you will, of what women like to highlight are less happy about highlighting um, and also just helping them pose and just feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, portrait photography is very intimate. Right. Like I, you have to touch, like physically touch people and it's like you might adjust like, you know, a lock of hair or a bra strap um, and you've like, like I've got hands on people, which during COVID is a completely different beast again. sure. sure. But, yeah, I sort of wanted to take away that anxiety and come from a place of kindness and compassion to deliver photos that they're like, I'm, you know, looking pretty hot today and just be really proud of it Um, Mm -hmm. and then walk away with their, like, you know, their head held a bit higher, a bit of a spring in their step and just to show them that, you know, there is – 
they're beautiful yeah. and everybody's beautiful. You just need to sort of know how that relates to a two dimensional machine. Right. 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 Yeah. Do you want me to elaborate on that? No, no. I mean, it, don't let me stop you. Just the uh, processing. Okay. It's a lot. No. We're, co- we're covering ground today. No, it's, well, that's good. <laughs> it's, we're going wherever the conversation takes us. Um, like the person who trips a shutter today, when you're there and you're tripping a shutter today, the images that I see in your studio, at least, are of, are of children, <clears throat> yes. not necessarily of adults. So I don't know. I don't see that. How that can how that translates to your work with. They're coming. Okay, no, no, it's <laughs> great, coming. it's great. Uh, so this blank wall behind you, that's going to be my gallery wall. Oh, wicked. Yeah. How long have you been here? Um, I only got the keys on the 31st of December. Oh, nice. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> it's very new. It feels really great. Yeah, it's very new. So keys on the 31st, open to the public on the 20th. In what capacity? As, um, as in doing space? shoots here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, this Still was just a storage up, yeah. unit. Yeah, so I had to get lighting redone, electrics, painted, get the cupboards installed, all of that. Wicked. Yeah, it was it was great. It's just nice to have the you know a space to create in. Yes. Are you opening this up to other people to use with you? Yeah, great question. I was with I was with two really awesome chicks last year. They're both they're both in my Twenty Women series. One is Ria Chandramani. She's a she's an artist. She's an incredible painter, and the other is Belinda Esterhammer, who has a podcast and she's very involved in women in tech um, and entrepreneurship. She's she's just an amazing amazing girl, and just so young. You just like meet people under thirty. You're like, God damn it! Like I'm not even sure I still know if I've like what I'm doing with my final. I look I look older than I am. I'm 24. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> you're about. You're miles of hard road, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we were at, we were at so, we were at Soho House, and you know Belinda's talking about working from home, and I had Alex. I was working from home, and Ria is like I think her husband was like doing weird shifts. Sorry, her boyfriend is doing weird shifts, so he was working from home. I was just like, just we need to have somewhere where it's like it's affordable enough to like go there and hang out, and just but also private enough so that you can get your head in the game and get in flow and do something. And I'm like, why don't we just start a little women's space where, like, you can record a podcast, you can do painting, I can do a photo shoot, and we can all just hang out. Wow. And they're like, oh, Jules, it won't work. They've Wicked. tried it before. They've tried it before. It costs a fortune to set up. And I'm like, it's a white box. Like, I don't think so. So 2020 did its voodoo towards the end of last year, and I found myself, you know, on this precipice of, do I stay in Hong Kong or do I go home? And if I go home, what does that look like? And I was speaking to some really amazing friends and they're like, Jules, you've got a business. You've got income. This is your home. Like, do you want to try? And I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'll try. So, and then the dominoes just fell. So I found this place. Uh, it was a break lease. I got some really great opportunities coming up. I found a little apartment and it just sort of, it clicked. Great. Um, but yeah, we're going to be holding talks here. I want to do some movie nights. We had Habitat for Humanity do um, a live stream fundraiser in here a few oh, weeks wicked. ago. Wicked. So we proved it can happen. Yes. And just, you know, it's not, it's not one of those big mega co-working spaces, which are sort of more geared towards people who have, you know, a laptop and a headset. Sure. Like you can... You know, I want to get like people to come do like live painting and just spread out like a massive canvas on the floor. Right. It's like flows of energy, flows. Think of, like when it's raining, right? Like, yeah. Eventually, the water is. I didn't come up with this idea, but eventually, the water finds its own little rivulets, and then those rivulets find into other channels, and then larger streams, all this stuff, and, and they kind of find their own flow. And so, in the same way, people who bring their energy and the space and environment is going to evolve into whatever it needs to evolve into. Yeah, that's a really beautiful analogy. It's not mine. It's plagiarized. (laughs) Hey, it's 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 the highest form of flattery. (laughs) Uh, You know, listen, Julia, this has been really great. I love talking shop uh, and you delivered 100%. Thank you. Uh, I was nervous. You were nervous. Yes. It's like going to the dentist. You have great teeth. Don't worry about it. (laughs) 
uh, any any last any last things you want to give to somebody listening to this in terms of you know there's a 16 20 24 year old uh, beginning budding photographer the the 20 year old you what would you say oh my god her? I love this question so much um, I think like many creative careers people like look at people who are actually doing it and they're like but how did you get there like I just don't know how to do it and it's like for me it was you know, packing up your ego and putting it in a bag and going to a class and going, I want to do something, but I don't know how yet. Mm. Go to classes, go do online courses, ask a friend, go on walks uh, with a camera or, you know, if you if you want to be a dancer, look at YouTube videos or, you know, um, ask people. Generally, I think in the creative, in creative industries and in the arts, people are very helpful. Mm. And if you ask somebody, like, could I – could you teach me some things or could I watch you work? Like mm. in my experience, nine times out of 10, they're like, God, I would love that. Do you have any apprentices? Um, not, I've got an intern. Um, he's amazing. He's doing some work for me at the moment. I would absolutely love to. It's one of those things that you sort of have to have the time to think about yeah, and put in place a lot of properly. Women. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm kind of a one woman band um, at this stage, but yeah, I would absolutely love to have some, Proteges, <laughs> Julia. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this, I, this has been a, this has been great. We've been speaking for an hour. Thank you for your time. Are we going to do the cat's pee? Cats are bit. Well, do you want to? I, I was don't gonna, know. My original imp- impulse was when I was going to see you. The first thing I was going to say was, "Do you need a?" Oh, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, in Hong Kong, Fuck. people don't touch each other. Do you want to hug? Yeah, man, I do, I actually. Like, like, I, like lost, I lost it at hours. I know, I know. <laughs> you need a hug. Come on. Um, oh, mm. Jesus Christ. Can you believe it? Um, I don't know. So, I guess what I'm trying to do at the moment is get as much work as I can. Mm. And what I'm nervous about is people thinking, holy fuck, she's going to drop dead and never give me my images. Um, mm. These are real fears. I mean, but what, what, what does your gut tell you? My gut? Yeah. About, from, about, about, gut? Telling, about telling the story in this forum. Uh, well, the whole point of the podcast is raw. It's genuine. It's, it's, it's just, in a way, you're... you're, 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 you're this is what's, I think, shocking, is that you have you your life, right? And then one day, boom, you get this, this news that completely, you know, well, it's kind of like with, with the pandemic, where all of a sudden you're just like, wait, no, no, the world's supposed to look like something, and yeah. now it's really looking like... This is really inconvenient. Or, but, but it's also like, how do, you, how do I process this? Yeah. You know? And so you'll go through the whole slew of emotions like you know denial and anger and having been in a few near-death experiences this is kind of what prompted the the, the podcast and this impulse which is every second is a gift totally you know and so and now now what after you get that phone call and your brain's like what the fuck and then you know you you look at alex you're looking at her with completely different eyes yeah uh so i feel that with you as a human, as a primate, as a as a human animal, you're going to lean towards the more negative side, because as a, as a defense mechanism. Yeah. So, just be aware that while you're telling yourself that story of negativity, that's the bias that is not necessarily the outcome. So, luckily, it's early stage. Luckily, it's yeah. Yeah. What's what's your process? Yeah. So for for background, um, after, you know, weird, I always joke like never had chicken pox, never had measles, never broken a bone, had dysentery, mm. had like a 10 centimeter ovarian cyst. Like I just get oh, okay. weird, wow. weird stuff. Yeah. But, you know, after, after a really big turbulent few months um, and just going, because I do do support women and I think the world would be a much better place if women actually help each other instead of trying to drag each other down. I wanted to tell this story and just to, to listen to ourselves and listen to our bodies. 
So after a, a few months of just feeling off and I'm like, something is not right, um, I got a pap smear and I got a follow-up, which is a procedure called a colposcopy, which is um, the process of taking pieces of tissue, biopsies, from the cervix and um, through the cervix into the neck of the womb, which is um, as pleasant as you think it sounds. <sighs> and, you know, people are like, oh, Jules, I'm sure it's fine. It's going to mm. be fine. I'm like... I don't think it is going to be fine. Eventually, it will be fine. But right now, I don't think it's fine. And unfortunately, I was my my intuition was right. So um, this past Monday, so that's um, five five days ago. I'm not sure when you're going to air with this. Yeah, I had a um, appointment at eight a.m. on the eighth of March, also International Women's Day. Met with. The doctor who I probably traumatized during the colposcopy a few weeks back, and he said, "Like, you know, it's not good news." Like, well, I wasn't expecting an eight AM <laughs> doctor's appointment to be good news. And he said, "Yeah, I'm sorry to say that the diagnosis is cervical cancer, and you just have that. You know that you know in like movies or books, it's like your life flashes before your eyes. Mm-hmm. I didn't receive, I didn't get that. I just got this wave of like." What? And once again, like, I knew it was going to be bad. I didn't know it was going to be the big C bad. Mm. So, of course, immediately I'm on the phone to my mum and dad. I'm an only child. And, you know, they knew I was nervous. Yeah. And, you know, my dad was like, going like, but you're going to be fine. Like, you know, when like parents do that thing with sure. the children, like, but you will be fine. Yeah. I'm like, I may not be fine. Mm. And it's like, holy shit. So, like, I'm getting on a plane. I said, you can't. And they said, why not? And I said, there's, there's a pandemic. Huh. And yeah, so I was in hospital for like eight hours on Monday, and it's just like meeting with people, tests, you know, talking through what it looks like, what what happens from here. So the diagnosis is stage one, um, a two centimeter tumor on the cervix. The treatment will be radical hysterectomy, and you know how you have like intrusive thoughts, and I keep thinking of like this, like you know, eighties like surfer dude going like totally radical Mm. and that's that's huge news and you know i'm not i'm not super young but i'm certainly not menopausal either so i think that's a lot to sort of take on and with all of my work with like you know empowering women um and doing that it was just like what makes you a woman like is it how you identify is it your ability to create life is it your uterus so i think that's a that's a journey i'm starting this is all pretty new so right now it's like the the, i'm in the get shit done stage so i'm like we need to we need to book shoots we need to work we need to tell who we need to tell we need to figure out financing because i'm going to be laid up for at least a month what does that look like for my pipeline how will my daughter take it so I think over the next few weeks, um, I think I'll try and take some stock and just, and I've been, I was encouraged to write about my experience because there is so much secrecy and shame around women's health. You know, women don't talk about hysterectomies. Breast cancer has only become a sort of hot button issue, what, in the last, what, 15, 20 years? There was always that, like, you need to keep it private, you need to keep it amongst the family. So for the people who know me, they know that I'm very TMI about absolutely everything. Me too. We're going to get them great. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so the whole thing about shame and not talking, and clearly that's not me. No, well, clearly not. Kind of describe yourself a little bit as a type A-ish Leader. Ish, type Ish. A enthusiast. Yeah, yeah. You know. So one, I think one part of it is is to try to wrap your head around things, right? Yeah. In your in your work, of all the things that you can be uptight about, one thing that you admit to, and that you've selected to admit to, is that cropping. That's selecting. You know, like, yeah, yeah, it's not a mistake that it says okay, right? And it's almost like if you think if you, let's make a connection on what's on the street. What it says on the street is look right. What it says in the in the image is okay, right? And it's almost it's not a question; it's like a it's like a statement, you know. And 
the kind of photography you do is, and you prefer to do, is in the studio where you're set, you're in control of the lighting, you're in control of the background, you're not fussing around with people's houses and all these little extraneous uh, elements. You're in control of this environment so that you're communicating the vision or whatever you have in your head. So it's, it's clear and clean. And one way of processing being told that you have cancer is, okay, I need to put a schedule and timeline on this. I need to make sure the pipeline is there. And luckily, thankfully, you can live on the assumption that, yeah. you're, that the prognosis is okay. It's going to suck because it's going to feel terrible. But looking at it after the fact may look back, you know, because for example, I was, I was in a coma and I was paralyzed and, you know, all this stuff. But what really kind of has stayed with me is being thankful for, and luckily I survived. Totally. Gratitude and because we have access to so much and there is, you know, affluenza and it's like, well, I've got a nice house, but it's not the best house. Right. Or it's like, well, you know, I've got a good, a good job. It's not a great job. Right. And I think for me, I'm like, you are missing it. You are missing how special today is mm. because mm. we don't know what we've got left. Absolutely. We don't, we don't, there isn't, I mean, we've all got a countdown clock. We just don't know when it runs out. Yeah. And something that I really, that I worked on through, you know, Janine and then like subsequently speaking to a therapist, you know, I think lots of artists do have a melancholia is just, you know, appreciate what you've got because we don't all get it. Right. What strikes me about your energy and your attention and your time is to be careful of what you're looking at as an observer and sharing with others, but being really attentive to, to that moment in time. So in this image of the guy on the bike in Shamsripo, let's just say what the shutter speed was. It's like 1 250th of a second yeah. or whatever. It's like a lifetime, a full lifetime is in that moment. Yeah. And then in a way, each time you wake up in the morning, that's like a gift. Right? Completely, completely. And... I'd sort of been, I'd been working on that anyway because it's just, you know, I think you said in an email, it's like I love waking up on a Monday and you don't know, you don't know what, what today's going to bring. <laughs> Fuck. But you <laughs> do. I, so, yeah, so I send you this message on the oh, Monday. In hindsight, the timing was actually Holy fucking shit. terrible. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm just like, why can you call, email me back, please? And you're just like. No, I. I in hindsight, that's actually really funny. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's so fine. But you know, we've all got we've all got friends who just you know didn't make it, or you know had a, a, their life cut short, or something like awful happens. Like you, right. you, you in your coma. Like you don't schedule that. No, you no, don't go like so. I think in about six weeks, it should be a really good time to have a massive family emergency, exactly. right? You just you don't have control over this, yeah. which is why you need to do it now. And that's how I treat my photography, my, my clients as well. I'm like, if you are well now and you have the means and you want to tell a story, just do it yeah, just now. Do it. How how do you feel about this idea of embracing experience as a means to understand? So one hundred percent. You've had to live with this idea now for about five days. Right? Yeah. You know, what can you say about it? Um, when I found out and it's, it's a lot to absorb. Um, so what I realized, you know, after working with a career coach, like I realized like I love taking photos and I love telling stories. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's, that's what Jules is all about. Right. Right. So but I knew that we were, we were due to chat and I was speaking to a friend who's like from like, he's. He's, he's a brand's marketing guy and he's like, look, I've seen your work and I know, I know you and I know what you do. Like you could, you could tell this story. And he so said that fits in with, you know, you wanting to help women and, you know, empower women and all that sort of stuff. And he said like, if you feel comfortable sharing it, do it. Mm. And I'm like, dude, I love talking about myself. This is mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. So in a way it is, this is a huge, you know, it's an opportunity. Like my mum has a saying, like it's an ill wind that doesn't blow any good. Mm. 
would prefer it wasn't. Of I'm course. sure there are other ways of, of, you know, going through personal growth. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there, there is like an ownership to saying, okay, having a hysterectomy doesn't, it's like there's this person, you. Yes. And vessel of the body. It's like this big, it's tiny. So. Such a, so much fuss over such a tiny thing. Right. You know, if I chopped off your arm, is that... You? Would I be less Julia? Right, exactly. Yeah. Like you are... I'd actually find it so inspiring that you would figure out a way of however you internalize and however you communicate that and let that come through. I think I... For me, I, and when I found out, it's like I want to be with people and, you know, if people help people, the world will be a better place, right? Yeah. So I do wear my heart on my sleeve and I am an empath and I just like to share. Sure. I didn't expect to be telling my story quite like this, but here we are. You know, you you can always say, let's not keep this. No, I think I'm okay. Um, I just didn't, like, obviously you're going to sort of slice and dice this um, and put it into something that is not a rambling. As little as possible. Non, really? Yeah, as little as possible. So is life really a gift? Really? Can you make every second count? That's the whole point of the podcast. So if you like what you've seen and you're inspired, because that really is my mission, then please give it a like, subscribe, and share. Shooting it raw? Yes, shooting it raw.